and uh, welcome to The Economist events, the new CIO challenge, Millennials and the New Way to Work. That's a long title for a very, very important subject. Uh, I'm Martin Giles, the US technology correspondent of The Economist, and uh, I'm delighted that you can join us today to discuss this really important topic. The biggest, most dramatic shift we're going to see in the workplace over the coming years is the entry of the millennial generation. They're already in. There's going to be a lot more of them coming through. Uh, they're about 36%, about a third of the workforce right now. Um, but by 2025, according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, roughly uh, three jobs in four will be held by millennials. That's a massive shift. And it's, they're not just sort of going to be influential as employees. They will also be influential as consumers. Uh, Oracle has put, made a prediction that by 2018, the millennial generation will be the biggest spending generation, uh, roughly forking out about $4 trillion a year. So that's a lot of money. They're, they're also fickle. Um, some statistics say they spend about an average of two years at a particular job uh, compared to five years for Generation X and around seven for baby boomers. So there's a, a real challenge for companies in managing uh, this new generation of, of employee. And uh, I'm delighted to have with me uh, four very, very uh, thoughtful and uh, influential panelists. Uh, immediately to my left is Peter Greco, Director of Portfolio Management North America for Unify. Uh, to Peter's left is Kevin Suhu, Chief Information Officer of Air Systems, an MCOR company. To uh, Kevin's left, I have Paul Papadrimitriou, who is the Management Consultant and Digital Futurist. And last but not least, uh, Melanie Turek, who is Vice President Research Frost and Sullivan. Um, I'd like to say a big thank you to Unify for hosting this event. And you know, this is really an event for you. Um, I'd love you to submit questions uh, as you hear our panelists uh, talk about different issues. You can do that via our website, um, which you're currently using to watch the virtual event. But you can also do it via Twitter at hashtag CIO Challenge. And we'll attempt to answer as many of them, of them as we can through the course of this conversation. So let's get started. A big picture. Um, Paul, why, why are we worried so much about millennials? I, mean, I cited some statistics, but you know, how big a shift is this, and, and what kind of implications does it, does it have? First, I'm going to just go, you said they're, they're a fickle bunch, right? Yeah. But I would say the average generation is, is, is created out of the conditions they were born in, economical conditions, about the values. Are they really fickle, or is just are these the result of you know all the economical crisis, the depressions, one after the other, the, the, the new technologies they have access to? So you have to be very careful about misunderstanding. I will just use one a little quote, and I'm sorry to pull out my phone. It's a very millennial thing to do. It's a very millennial thing to do. I'm 38. I'm okay. just above that. No, right? you can't so, get away with it. Exactly. Okay. Plus, you know, look here. <laughs> Uh, the children now love luxury. They have bad manners, contempt for authority. They show disrespect for elders and love chatter. That was Socrates that said that like more than 2,000 years ago, <laughs> meaning that every generation that comes in, the, rebels, the, one, right. the one before is like they don't understand it. Right. I, I think that millennials are important because they actually they show it's an emerging generation that shows uh, uh, uses the, these emerging technologies, the one I just pulled off my pocket, and that creates new values. And hence, that also creates the, the uh, new values in the workplace. How do they consider the workplace? What is a workplace for them? What is even a career for them? Uh, would they like, like to work in a, in, a, in a big corporation or not? Uh, you know, you hear all these stories, and I know some of you guys here live in, mm. uh, around the Silicon Valley. Would you not rather prefer to work in a startup environment instead of working in a big corporation? And then also within the corporation, how do they communicate? How do they collaborate? What tools do they use? How do they, you know, how do they work with, with each other? So, so this is this is a shift. This is a, right. and it's a very. I mean, just look around your kids. I mean, how do they communicate? How do they, they, they all, I mean, we had discussions just before the panel. And you're all baffled. And basically, it's the same thing. Is the business how will business actually adapt to this reality? Right. But I, I, I really want to say something is that because you use the term fickle which I, I love because I hear, I, hear, I hear that a lot you have to be careful not to misunderstand that generation not to say oh you know what they're just like they disrespect us no they have a, just a different set of mind and we have to adapt you're, you're nodding um, do yes. you agree yes absolutely I've, I've raised millennials I apologize for that <laughs> contribution to society but we're finding that in the, in the businesses we're working with that uh, one there's an insistence that they can bring their personal devices uh, to work, that's an essential. And the other thing we've noticed, and we talked about earlier, is that there's some great technology out of there, out there. But if it's not easy to use, 
If people can't use it immediately, they're not going to adopt it. So this ability to make it very easy to use, have everything they want at whatever device they want to use, and move it from device to device, it's absolutely essential. I wouldn't call that a millennial concession as much as that's an attribute of those tools that they like that are being adopted even by immigrants to the technology as well as natives to it. I think the important thing here when we're talking about this is to make a distinction between sort of what Paul was referring to, the fact that every younger generation goes through this. They're always different from the generations before them, but also there's an age-specific behavior. I mean, when you're an adolescent, when you're in your early 20s, you act a certain way, and right. whatever technology is available to help you do that, fine, right? Um, but as you grow up, as you mature, that changes a little bit. So we need to make sure we're distinguishing between simple sort of adolescent, for lack of a better word, behavior, which may stretch into one's 20s, and a real shift in how people interact with technology and then with one another. And I think the interesting thing about this particular millennial generation is that there's both things going on. So it will be you know, sort of over the next five to 10 years that we'll see what is really the technology driving this? Because these are kids who grew up with their digital natives, right? And what is simply something that will be outgrown? Mm -hmm. Right. Kevin, in your workplace, I mean, what are you, what are you seeing? Is it very, very important for you, this, this, this big picture shift? I mean, how, how do you deal with that in terms of, uh, of your company? Yeah, you know, big impact right now in innovation, how we view new technology, how we embrace the new workforce and what their ideas of how to get work done. So what we do is we try to have, we do have committees, so we have a, a tech innovation committee and, and even though they're not necessarily comprised of all millennials, um, the idea is let's just bring any and all ideas to the table. Um, what we do today from an IT perspective, from a business perspective, may not work tomorrow or years down the road. So we need to be proactive and get people involved and have them bring those ideas. Not every idea is going to be a success. We will fail, but from every failure, we right. learn something very valuable and we grow from there. The, I, I, would, I, would, I would say something, you said something, Kevin said something very smart. He said that, that they're not only millennials. We have also to be careful and not, not just centering on millennials. There's a set of behaviors that sometimes somebody that is actually older or younger can have a similar kind of set of behaviors. Mm -hmm. And there's, and the, you said it very right, there's these two elements at the same time, this alignment of planets with suddenly technology, the rise of technology, the falling price disruption is going much faster. So you have these two, two things happening at the exact same time. And just an example, uh, which is very uh, important for, for corporations, is that this is more powerful than a, a laptop three years ago. And the purchasing a cycle is much faster. So this is why you have suddenly this all you know, consumerization of IT and bring your own devices. That it's not only because a younger generation has a different set of, of behaviors and they like to chat and use other, other devices. It's also because these devices overgrown uh, the, 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 the pace at which procurement can actually buy uh, new, new technologies within corporations. Right. It used to be that right. you would go in a, in a corporation and the computer you had there were much better than one you had at home. And that's the opposite. Right. Right. But let me play devil's advocate for a moment because Melanie says, you know, I just don't don't pick out this generation. But you know, I, I have millennials at home, and uh, you know, the way they operate is totally different to anybody I have ever seen, including you know a lot of my friends from past generations, Generation X. They will multitask if they're not doing five things at once, right? When they're doing their homework, there's a problem, and they can do all this incredibly efficiently in ways like so. You can see these people coming into the workforce, and not only will they come into the workforce with different expectations of how work working patterns should be, but they'll also have responsibility far faster than other generations because, of course, Generation X, there's a big de demographic dip. And so we have a lot of boomers leaving the workforce, so all of a sudden management positions have got to be filled, and you're going to have tons of millennials pouring into these management positions very quickly with a very different mindset. So it's, isn't that a big, big shift? It's a, it's a huge shift, and I think that um, it has implications on a couple of different levels. So the first is we need to see whether multiple multitasking really works, right? So typically, you know, the, the conventional wisdom, such as it is, is that it doesn't, right? That it's very hard to actually get good work done when you're multitasking. The question is, well, is that true just for us old fogies? Yeah. Uh, because right. our brains weren't mapped to do that when we were growing up and right. we were developing. Maybe it is different for these kids who literally grew up 
multitasking, and their brains perhaps adapted to that. So that will be an interesting thing to see. The other thing is, I think that the cultural shift that's going to be required. Um, so we were talking earlier about you know companies that right now, for example, it's policy to place bans on what you can access, application services, and so, so on. So this is banning use of things yeah, like you know, Twitter, you can't go and, on Twitter Facebook, and Facebook, and cloud, work, right. and so on, because you know it's going to distract you or somehow. That seems outrageous, right? Well, it or not. does. Yeah, but it also, you know, sort of begs the question, well, does that even matter for these millennials? They, it, it is not the same type of distraction, perhaps. Or maybe it's just a replacement for reading a newspaper mm -hmm. or doing what, you know, wa walking to the water cooler and chatting for 15 minutes. So we, all of these things come into play. It, does, uh, it brings yeah, up ahead, the other, another point about, about, we talked about the cloud, is that the other factor we didn't talk yet about is how many of these workers, millennial or otherwise, aren't in a building. Mm -hmm. Kevin talked about having a meeting, having a committee. Awful hard to have a committee if the people are disparate locations, time zones, countries, languages. So that ability for technology to overcome that is still a little bit of a hurdle. Uh, we mentioned that the, the millennials can do five things at once as long as one of them isn't taking out the trash or <laughs> getting gas in the car That's when they true. borrow it. But uh, not to bring up personal. We must have the same case. But, yeah. but, the, uh, but the reality is that even employees, I have 10 employees that work for me, none of them are in the same state as I am. There are three different time zones. How do I get them? And you know when you're doing an audio conference call, they're multitasking. Because yep. you ask them how you're doing, they ask you to rephrase that question, they didn't quite get it. <laughs> So how do we accommodate that? And there is no real blueprint for doing that. And that's a, I think that presents a direct challenge to somebody like yourself. I've got to adopt this technology. I've got to adapt it and apply it to that really wide group of people. So how do you deal with this communications sort of and, and teamwork issues, Kevin, in your workplace? Well, just uh, really go back one point about yep. blocking, you know, all these things. It's, it's almost irrelevant. I mean, enterprise IT can put off the firewalls, but with the power they have in their hands with the phones, they're just going to go around you. So, I mean, just... One thing just to kind of put out there is, yeah, you can block all you want, but they're going to get, you're going to go around you one way or another. Uh, in terms of the point about, you know, collaboration communication, we have uh, in, in our in company, you know, construction sites, and so it, it is natural for us to collaborate because we have folks in the office in the field, and, and we'll start deploying tools. Um, from the IT perspective, we are not claiming we know everything anymore. We have the millennials who have so much technology, they grew up with it, they, they know almost as much from a technology standpoint how to use it. Than, than the IT departments now. So what we try to do is we collaborate with them. We will say, hey, here's an iPad, because they asked for an iPad. But we're not giving it to them on, on, on an open check. We're going to tell them, here's an iPad. Prove to me you can do something with it, but that will add value to their job. And we've gotten some very effective um, results from that. Can you give us an example? Yeah, so you know, iPad, kind of prevailing view before was just a toy, didn't do much. Right. But in, in our case, we found a, a killer app we'll call the killer app, that actually was construction specific. That allowed um, what you would imagine drawings and stacks of drawings to yeah. be all loaded on the iPad, which is one thing, but to be able to mark them up and do them real time and be very crispy from a performance standpoint and have that be synced with the field in the office is, was a huge productivity enhancement because now we're not waiting for that roll of paper to come back to the office and then have a drafter revise the print. They're doing it real time. They're dropping in pictures of the actual job site. So there was a real productivity uh, plus by having an iPad because of this oh, app. Very so it wasn't the technology, it was the, how you used it. I mean, you see that it. a lot in healthcare um, now more and more too, right, where you're using tablets. And mm -hmm. you know, most of us, if you've been to the doctor in the last year, I, I get, venture to guess mm -hmm. that he or she has come in with some kind of tablet device and is using that for imaging and you know seeing your x-rays, your, your scans, and so on. Um, uh, past medical history, perhaps collaboration with other um, mm -hmm. practitioners, something as simple as, as I need a prescription. All right, you, when was the last time you got a piece of paper for a yeah. prescription? It's automatically sent to your preferred pharmacy. All of that stuff. So those very specific applications mm -hmm. um, become very important for using that. But then, 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 then if you, if you, it's exactly because you both mentioned actually something that is medical practitioners actually never sit in their office, right? right? They right. move all the, all the time. Same when you mentioned multiple time zones. You work with teams that are remote. You work teams that mm -hmm. are on the field. So these are like you're in that sense you're like a forward because you've already had to adapt to these kind of. Food. But then if you look at millennials, more than seventy percent of 
them said, you know, there's no point being in an office. And for them, the, you know, we keep talking about work-life balance. There's not even work-life balance. It's completely porous. They overlap. It's the, hence, you know, hence the multitasking. But by the way, you said they were very efficient at doing this. So, I you know, did maybe, say they were very efficient. So probably, like, we'll like you yeah. mentioned, maybe, you know, it's not, we say, oh, it's very strange the way they behave. Will they be able to achieve any work? But then again, they might be very efficient. They, they will. But I mean, so companies will just adapt to this point of, okay, how do we, how do we cater for this generation that doesn't need to be maybe in the office, that, that, that can work from home, or can work remotely, can work from wherever in the world, and what kind of tools can we, can we give them uh, to actually make them more easier and more efficient? And Peter, what, so how yeah. do you do that? Yeah, that's well, one of the things we talked about. Is it's even changed. Kevin was talking about the killer app. It even changed the way we've developed our solutions in that we've gone from sending the developers into the bunker for six months, come on back, bring us something and see if the, the field likes it, if the customers like it, to kind of, we, first we have a partner for developing some of our solutions now that specializes in things that are easy to use and delight users. And the other is more rapid prototyping. We go out, sit with customers. Let me watch how you do your job. Let me suggest where the obstacles are, and then we go back and test it and come back so that you're not doing every six months. You're rolling out apps like many software companies to say, what's the latest and greatest I can do? Right. So, so then you can see it in a real life example and then rapidly and, develop And I it. would venture to guess that over the next several years, we'll see a couple of other shifts in that development process and from a user experience um, you know, from the consumption process so that you know there will be, A, an app store where I can go and get my enterprise apps, and there'll be an enormous variety of them, right, so that I can see what's going to work for me. Um, and the other thing is, I think it will, that process will become less and less formal, oh, yeah. right, mm -hmm. so that eventually it's the actual end user who mm -hmm. may, in fact, be tweaking an app or a service for his or her specific needs, mm -hmm. right. and there will be customization available to that person to do that. Right? Can, can I ask you, I mean, I, I did say that they were fickle, but productive, though, and so I've been sort of trying to balance it so my millennials don't disown me, but <laughs> there's also this issue of feedback, right? I mean, this is a generation that's been coddled and, and sort of surveyed, mm -hmm. not quite NSA style, but, but by their parents, they've been ever told what they have to do each day and every day. They get into the workplace, and the employers I talk to say to me, God, these guys, they need feedback all the time. <laughs> they want every meeting they want something. Is this something that is a, a good thing? Because if you're getting feedback, you might be more efficient, more productive if someone tells you what's not working. And B, can technology help here? They're looking for mentors. I mean, yeah. it's a, every, every generation looks for mentors. But I mean, now this is why we mentioned before the sense of purpose in a business, but when they also want the people they can have inspiration from. Right. So they look for mentors. They need, this is, yeah, yeah. They, they need that kind of constant feedback from people. This is why I was saying before, it, let's not misunderstand them. It's not that they don't want to work. Actually, profit, innovation, is a part of their key values as well. They're not a completely like, you know, if, if you do a, a work a work cloud of what is the purpose of business back, you know, for a, a, the previous yeah. generation, profit will be like the, the big word right. in the middle. Mm -hmm. Profit, prosperity, these are words that still exist in the vocabulary of the younger generation. It's just that they're also overlapping with, you know, sustainable sustainable development with, you know, but that mentorship, they, they need mm -hmm. mentors. And don't forget, because you said we cuddled, or you cuddle because I'm. Yes, I'm. Yeah. Yeah. We, we <laughs> cuddle. You cuddle, but you also <laughs> said that, that this generation <laughs> also <laughs> learned <laughs> that you know they could do everything because we kept telling right. them you can be anything right. you want. Right. So yeah. of course, when you tell them you can anything you want, and the sky is the limit. Of course, you also create a set of values that's a bit different from oh, we have to work because they just have to pay month hand. Right. You know, so that's that's yeah. something we have to do. Well, can I, yeah, can I they take negative? The answer in feedback is the Facebook and Twitter. That's where that totally appeals to to that nature. But a lot of companies. But they block Twitter and well, Facebook. Well, more important than that, more important, because this is exactly right. So they've grown up, right, on Twitter, Facebook, etc. All they do all day long is get feedback. Mm -hmm. And to the point where it's sort of shaped, I think, perhaps any of us who are on that, what we do. So you're in the moment and you're thinking, how can I tweet this? What should I say? Right. How can I update this on Facebook? I need a picture. You know, it's, it's like the overlapping. But the question is, how can we in the workplace then take advantage of that or what do we need to shift Adapt. Mm -hmm. in order to give them back that feedback. So right. now, you know, you need tools within the workplace so that as I'm working and producing, I need a place where I can share that right. and it's going to allow me to get feedback. It doesn't have to be a call from my boss. It might just be 15 likes on my page, mm -hmm. but within that corporate environment. That's what we need to get to. Yeah, a couple of concepts, and, and this isn't a commercial, but this solution we talked before, this Project Ansible concept we have, uh, with the idea of a single pane of glass. So why can that, that person needs multiple stimuli, can look at three or four things at once, and if they're stuck, if they need that mentor, 
you use things like gamification mm -hmm. to say, let me see who knows about this, and you can strike up that conversation. And the cool thing is you contact with these folks, you have an interaction, whether it's a video, whether it's a, just looking up some, some information, you can now go back to that history and say, let me go back and see, here's the person I had, so you can informally or formally develop yeah. that. So Kevin, okay, sorry, in, in your workflows, do you see more demands coming from your millennials in your team than from the older generations? Yeah, certainly we do. I mean, they're, and, and fortunately for us, we do have a very collaborative environment where they are free to come, not necessarily in the technology or innovation forum or committee, but open door policy. Hey, Kevin, I have an idea. We need to do this, or why can't we do this, or this is too slow. And that's really where a lot of these great, effective things that we apply or applications coming out, because it just starts with someone not afraid to ask. Right. So in, in our culture, we're very open. So yeah, we have that nature where they're, 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 they're encouraged to come say something. But I think to that point then, it's really important from a management perspective, and so now we're talking probably to somewhat older people, to shift, you know, how are you evaluating your employees and their performance, mm -hmm. right? So you, you've got to look beyond just revenue generation mm -hmm. or, you know, whatever your normal metrics are. Right. Is this person spending 85% of his time helping other people? Well, in the past, there was really no way to measure that, and maybe he could never get very much done, and he seemed sort of useless. Mm -hmm. But now you can see, no, in fact, if he left the company mm -hmm. because we think he isn't produ producing very much, oh my gosh, would break. Uh, yeah, it would break. <laughs> Everybody relies <laughs> right, on him for right. information. It's so adding value. It is, it is adding value. Adding it's value. Soft. You it need is soft, to but... sort of rethink how you measure value. Right. Mm -hmm. cool. uh, to that point, exactly, when you were thinking about uh, collaboration software, you can actually track what people are actually doing, how they communicate. You know, you have the traditional org right. chart that says that person does that, that other person does that. The traditional very easy example is that, you know, you have a help desk and you're supposed to call that help desk when your computer crashes or something. But then again, usually in any company, you have that guy or that girl you actually call because right. you know that the problem will be solved. That in some of these new software, you can actually track and realize where are actually the, the actual connection being made, the nodes actually in the, within the company. And you say, oh, you know what? These people seem to be working well together. So let's actually even physically approach them. You know, there are, there are stuff you can actually surface with, with tools that can actually help these people make a, bit, a, a better job and being more, more efficient. I, I believe that's actually right. very, very, uh, very interesting. It'll be the, I'm sorry. No, no, please. It's please. an interesting please. phenomenon on that same topic is, will we get depth if people are moving, we said earlier, people will be moving from job to job to job. They won't have a lot of different experiences. It's great. Question. So will they get depth? And what's the potential for management among these millennials who are saying, I'm going to do this, and then I'll do this, and do this? Do we get, A, do they get the depth to be able to be in a management role? And do they have the desire to be in a management role? They will have role? better experience. Let's a life experience would be much better. It's a great point, actually. Mm -hmm. I, I agree. Um, this, is normally the, are pretty miserable. <laughs> <laughs> this is normally the point where we break to do the selfie, and then we do the mupload and try and make it the most sort of uh, uh, tweeted a uh, selfie ever, but we're not going to do that. In fact, what we have is some great questions that are coming through. And uh, I, I would encourage you, please, you know, if there are any other questions that you have, do, do send them through uh, to us because we, we will like to cover as much as we can. And it's obviously a great panel, as you can tell. A quick question. Um, Somebody asked, I was really struck with the multitasking conversation. You know, there are a lot of studies that indicate we're usually less effective. Uh, is it true that millennials really can be more effective at well, multitasking? I, see, I, th I think, and I think it's, the reason it's yet to be determined yes, is because, you know, the more we learn about how the brain works, it's, it's very malleable, but there's an enormous amount of growth between, you know, birth and, say, age 25. Right. And even at, you know, 18 or 19, your brain is still mapping those, those synapses are still being being formed. So, you know, I feel like studies on us, I'm in my 40s, are somewhat late, useless. Yeah. It's yeah. too late. Yeah. I mean, my brain was mapped not to do all of that right. stuff, so I'm probably not very good at it, although better than men, apparently, if <laughs> But, That's for sure. you know, will Sorry. my eight-year-old be productive at right. 26? Right. Well, I would assume, because the I human mean, body is, is very good at adaptation. Yeah, my, my two-year-old, who's... Adept with the phone, he will be on an ABC app and he'll have a YouTube song playing in the background. And then when this YouTube song is done, he'll switch back to the next YouTube video and he'll go back to his ABC app. So I mean, at two years old, yes, they are already exposed to that. And, That's amazing. And the millennials that have already, you know, have already come through. Just they grew up. You're right. The, the mappings have started much sooner than. Just watch for all those in-app purchases that he's doing yeah. when you don't know. Change the code. Change the code every month. <laughs> are they, they going to be worse? I mean, yeah. first, first of all. We, do, do we have, really have a, like, an alternative? I mean, this is how they grew up. This is how they will actually work. So I, I agree that we have some concerns. At the same time, maybe I'm being the optimistic here, but you know, 
we're resilient. Every generation knows, oh, the rock and roll is bad, or MTV is bad, or video games are bad. I mean, there's always like something, and you know, and we adapt. And we actually, even our generation, your generation, is we're all more multitaskers than the one pre previously. So right. I don't know at what point. Maybe we'll break at one point. Maybe we'll figure it out. Like out it was yeah. not good, but I, I don't think we have a choice. And I think we're, I'm pretty much sure they're re resilient. Okay, it was a great question. Thank you. And we we have another one, interesting one, which says, could the panelists comment on how companies are combining millennials with the older generations to come up with a sort of inter, uh, innovative ideas in the enterprise environment. So in our technology committee, steering committee, which is the innovation, it is not all millennials, like I mentioned. We cross section of different contributors along the company. Really the requirement that we look for as, as being a member of that is that you have a desire to improve your job in some function. Adding value, speed, more information, better decision making. If you have an interest in doing that, we would want you on that committee. So in, for, in our case and in our culture, we have that open Let's get everyone involved because you never know where the next great idea is. It doesn't well, matter what your and, age and is. Institutional knowledge does matter. You know, there is a reason why experience counts. Yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. understanding, and I think that works on a couple levels. One is specific to your company, your industry, whatever it may be, your job. I mean, if you're 25, you don't have that experience for the most Correct. part. The other thing is, is simply, and I mean, I'm going to sound like a mom, but you know, as I, I'm sorry, but I do know more than you, right? <laughs> I've been here for longer than you. I've been through a lot of what you're going through. And I can help. So I think it's very important that we don't write off you know, entire generations. The, the philosophy that we do have is I don't do your job, you don't do my job. But together, right. we can be very effective and figure out something that works. Do, do you mandate that there should be a millennial in every project like that? Or is it just up to them if they want to be in? It's up to them. But I think naturally, they're going to be they, more they're participative. Gonna be in, but right. we, we definitely try to be diverse. I, I exactly. another, another way that you, you kind of mentioned, I love the, the term bunker. Uh, it's something I've seen a lot of, a lot of companies do. With, uh, that, so innovation company is very becoming more and more popular, actually, these cross teams, you know. Um, but uh, the other one, the, the bunker, is basically innovation centers, a very secluded, self-sufficient unit within the company. Either they like the functions a bit like a startup within a company, they can hire even, mm -hmm. have their own uh, hires, they have their own decision making, they're allowed to fail, mm -hmm. because that's the other, other thing. I mean, major corporations, they don't like failure. Right. Whereas, I mean, you know, when you seclude these teams and say, okay, do something, whether it's Blue Sky ID or not, do something and you can fail, 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 like a startup basically. And I see a lot more and more of, the, of uh, big corporations setting up these very small units, sometimes a bit larger, but usually very small units that actually uh, innovate and Think iterate tanks. very, very, yeah. very, very Think quickly. Mm -hmm. And they, of, of course, obviously a lot, they are like people from the company and also non-millennials obviously, but you have a lot of millennials and they are attracted to that value proposition. When I hire someone, right. so, you know, you'd be on your own in a little project yes. and you know, they like that. And, and, in our company and customers we see, people are gathering around the millennials like the the monkeys in the beginning of 2001 around the obelisk. Ooh, that, there's, something, there's something important and valuable I can glean from these guys. Let me know how I can get it. So it is a two-way street. It's not a matter of, I, I know as a mom, the idea that I know more than you, absolutely, but there's, absolutely. there are tricks here. There are some things I can learn here. And, the third, and a third option, because that's also yes. a, a third option that you, you see a lot as well happening is that uh, companies creating incubation centers, so they're outside of the company, so they basically like a startup accelerator, yes. so they can attract the talent very, very early, and they try, there's, it's not been proven, right, because it's very early, but they try to say, okay, you do your own project, it, it can be completely unrelated to actually the business we're doing in our company, because that's a you know, disruption, it right. might be a new business. And they are, are really, these are not within the company, they're outside the company, and then you know, some projects may be then acquired, truly acquired, yes. not like they don't own the project, they can yeah. be acquired. So this is another way that companies are acting. And, and I've seen some companies where you you have sort of an upward mentoring structure, so you'll get the millennials to go sit with people yep. like me, and it will say, hey, that's really how it works? That's fabulous. God, I thank you so much for, for telling me. And now you become a valuable partner of mine in ways you, know, you don't seem like this sort of group of uh, unusual but people. But you learn as well yet. from them. Mm. That's well, the thing they the like process. as well. They, they'll come right. to you when they made a mistake, when something yeah. hasn't worked. <laughs> <laughs> and in a good way. It's like, now, now I'm open to it. Right. Any education, I think, requires you to open, and Very usually true. failure is the best way to open somebody. But, but you know, the question of failure, the freedom to fail, I think is an important one. And, and I think that there are two sides to it, though, today. Um, one is that corporate America is, in fact, not very good at embracing failure. So, yes, of course, there are... Or taking criticism. Or Yeah, and, and there are examples that, that counter that, you know, Google and, and whatnot, that, that can show that, in fact, embracing failure can be a great way mm -hmm. to succeed, but most of corporate America is extremely failure averse. And so that freedom to fail is a nice idea, but how many companies are really doing it? 
Um, and then the second thing, which I think will be interesting to see how it plays out, is that a lot of these millennials were never given the chance to fail. Now, yes. we can talk about Silicon Valley and the startup <laughs> mentality, and of course that's a little different. But for the majority right. of these kids growing up in America, right, they got a trophy for showing up. Gold star mentality. You can be anything yeah. you want to be. Gold star so mentality. it'll be interesting to see whether they can actually embrace this idea so it's time failure. to promote failure. I'm, I'm, I'm deeply okay. optimistic well, about well, the American world. I'm willing to stand, <laughs> put myself up as a standard. I just, I just don't want to, if we, we don't have to fall but, into the trap that you sometimes have in the Silicon Valley where these is like failures become almost like you have, have to, to fail. fail. No, no. <laughs> it has to have a balance between failure, right. accepting failure, and a rework, which I is the other. Right. It's like you find a success. Why did we have success? Mm -hmm. You know, so if you only look at success, then you might just be luck. Yes. But mm -hmm. if, so, if you have the two, the rework model and, and uh, uh, allowing to fail, then you can have something that can work. Uh, I'd like to take another question from the, uh, from the uh, audience because there's some, some great questions coming through. Please, please keep sending. Um, this one is, that, do millennials value choice over fully integrated solutions? How much should IT basically script the user experience and how much sort of, you know, telling millennials what they've got to have and how much freedom should they give? Should they give millennials more freedom than other generations? I think the, that notion that? is interesting. I mean, the, the, we talked earlier about course correction and, and, and how we, you know, a lot of apps are developed now and it's very, very, rapid prototyping and you pl apply, apply that to what you do and, and giving them, hey, here's the idea, here's what we want to accomplish and then letting them have input, letting them, engaging them, that's basically what you're doing. If you're, in, if you're able to engage them to get the end result, that is going to be, I think, far more powerful to get what you want ultimately because they were involved. Because isn't, there's a tension though, isn't there? Because st standardization, you know, yeah. one platform, save money. Right. They're used to, is, yeah, they're used to just better. choices. Because right. if they go on their yeah. app store, they can get 500 Absolutely. different calculators. Uh, Absolutely, I'm going to take the best or, one yeah. for this, the best one for that. You right. can't avoid choice. So you're fighting with the tide if that's what you're trying yeah. to do. Mm -hmm. But what I think uh, not enough IT organizations are doing today is taking their cues from the choices that their employees are making. Correct. Because, um, you know, I'll let you tell the example of, of Prezi, but I mean, basically, if you see the people within your organization are choosing to use a particular type of application or application, you gotta ask yourself why? And why aren't we giving it to them in a way that meets our control and security requirements, mm -hmm. but answers their need for choice? Yeah, we had a millennial in our engineering group that used Prezi, and he, was, he made a very nice Prezi. It was for a very well-known customer. Um, the learning lesson, though, was he put a lot of this potentially sensitive information in the Prezi, and we found out it was a free account. Oh. So what would happen oh. with the free Prezi is then it's public domain. Oh, yes. So we were able to quickly find out, and we were able to shut it down. And in retrospect and in learning, that was probably the bad, the worst reaction we could have. We sh at that time, we should have embraced it and should have said, why did he do this? How is it different from PowerPoint, which is the de facto standard? And, and because through certain other events that have happened, Prezi is now our standard for yeah. presentation. And, and kind of ad hoc uh, or anecdotal was, you know, this engineer now who goes on sales calls, he said, like, you know, Four out of five sales calls he did using Prezi, he he closed, he he won. It's, it's, I mean, so, so it's more so what, anecdotal. what should you have done? Should you have just bought a single license for them? And yes, said, I mean that's what we ended up doing. We bought the license so they could right. be privatized in the information, but just the initial reaction. It was an opportunity for us to embrace that, and we. We failed, mm. but we learned. It's, we it's, learned from the failure. It's a hundred right. bucks. Yeah. You know, that's the thing. I mean, I see a lot of comp companies being blocked about like a policy when you say, oh, an account is a hundred bucks. I completely agree with you. You, have, you know, let, let, let them try and take the cues like why, maybe this tool we never heard about, procurement has never heard about, ideas never heard about, mm. maybe something that will actually make it useful. You know, it's a generation that is defined by experience. Yeah. And in that yeah. sense, user experience. So any company, if you offer them, if you say, okay, you cannot use that, you cannot use Dropbox or Box, you know, these file sharing. But the alternative within the company is completely non-user friendly. They will, they will find right. a way around it. Yeah. Right. So but go around. Myself. it is not, yeah. you know, it's go not, around. it's, it's not the same hard. thing with consumer, cons consumerization of IT. Yeah. Uh, though I was working with a company uh, that, you know, they, they were uh, defining should they allow people to bring their own phone, uh, their own device, as we say now, in the company. More than 35% of the devices in the network were already rogue. So, yeah. Yeah. you know what, it's just, yeah. it's that. people, well, they want user Lisa, experience. You're, you're going to say something? Very briefly, there's a dirty word, and, and you used it a little, while, uh, a little while ago, that is overlooked. It is a little bit of a sales job. We don't internally sell what we want to do, and the, the most effective salespeople are people who listen to what their customers want. 
and reflect what they want and what they provide, mm -hmm. as opposed to enabling or legislating something and saying, let me sell this to you right. by making sure I address what you want. And I think mm -hmm. that's what we have to do more of. There's an interesting question uh, come in uh, asking about data mining. And, and basically it says, you know, uh, growing, uh, there's a sort of growing avoidance of, of data, suspicion of giving data among millennials, and that's actually I would say about among everyone, but particularly you know, among millennials are saying, well, who's watching me? How might this affect the workplace is the, is the question. I, I, some people would say, actually, they'll just give you anything so long as they get something in return that's, right. that's meaningful to them, so they're not really worried. But uh, do any of you see concerns among Privacy. millennials? Privacy. Yeah. More among well, millennials than others? In, I'm not sure. About it, that. But no, that's interesting so. because if, uh, five years ago, you would have asked anyone to say, no, they don't care. Privacy, privacy yeah. is dead. And yeah. actually, yeah. this is why when I say we have to be careful about not misunderstanding the generation, right. either. not only they're learning, but also it's, it's a generation that actually cares. It's not because they're sharing a lot that they don't care about privacy. Though it's true, security is something, you know, I guess security is not something you see like privacy unless it hits you. Unless you lose some data, unless you have data about you being re released from a problem that you were not ready to be released. Yes. Then, so it's true that the, uh, the sensitivity to security within the company is not something that they actually really embrace from the get-go. Yeah, but they, something they want to get it yeah. work done. The guy yeah. who used Prezi, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, just right. doing his job. So that, that changes that changes the role of the IT. I think, I think IT has to point. be more learning, teaching, right. like taking the cues, like you said, taking, seeing what, yeah. at the same, but just not yeah. impose policies. But say, okay, they want to use this, so how can we make that secure? I, I think that the changing notions of privacy, which we're starting to see among this group, is actually a, a product of maturity. So that goes mm -hmm. back to what I said at the very beginning. How much of this is simply just adolescent behavior? Right. And you know, we can all think back to when we were 15, 16, 22, and what we were willing to share and do without much thought, and what you know, over time you realize, oh, maybe there is a risk associated with that that I wasn't aware of right. or I didn't agree. really I care about. Yeah. So there's that. But I think the other issue is beyond privacy and security is intellectual property. Mm -hmm. So ideas of what is mine, what is the company's, what is public information. And, you know, I, I've sort of said in the past, if, if the information age was the 20th century, the innovation age is where we're at now. And the actual data is less important increasingly than what you do with it. Yes. Because the actual data is pretty much available to everybody. So, mm -hmm. yeah, there are some companies and certainly some government institutions and so on where privacy still matters enormously. But you could also probably say, well, if I found out what Apple is planning to do in the next six months with its iPhone, well, how much value would that really have for me, right? And I think we're going to start to have to weigh some of these questions more. Yes. I think for CIOs, that is a top challenge, is protecting the digital assets, protect, protecting your information assets, because it is so easy to get stuff out inadvertently or, on, you know, accidentally. It's going to happen, and, and there's a whole industry right now popping up around. Uh, there's an investment implication of it. They're right. going to go this direction, yeah. market But do, do we think millennials are a greater cyber security risk than, than Gen X or, or the baby boomers? I think that age group has always been. The phone. That's, that's the phone. Yeah, just so ubiquitous so and easy to just post anything. So yeah. they don't, they don't know, the they may not exactly. realize. It's right. the device. Exactly, yes, be careful. The access, the vehicle. Not, not right. that you're pointing the generation, but saying it's just at the fact that there's so much. Yeah. Yeah. No, 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 not talking about you, don't worry. The ease of what it can be. Yeah. 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 Well, and, and this desire to collaborate and share yeah. necessarily means you're sharing information. What else would you be sharing? Right. right. So when right. you're in school, what you're sharing doesn't much matter. Yeah. But when you get into the workplace, suddenly it does. Mm -hmm. so I, I would think that age group has always been more open. As they get older, they get a little bit more judgmental, or I should say maybe mature in their, in their judgment. <laughs> uh, <laughs> not judgment. That's the mom is a judgment. <laughs> but the uh, but the idea is that now they have more powerful tools with which to, to be perhaps less discreet. And the, and the mindset is everything is a remix for them. So there's like you know it's access you know for music so all, all, everything that was already artifacts like music books it was already free they downloaded right. it for free. So right. for them it's what you do with it again yes. exactly so everything is a remix. And by the way I, even for companies when they protect the, their IPs like very strongly it's already a remix mm -hmm. anyway. You know it's like we have I yes. know the patent clause is a lot of discussion around it. But I mean again. Innovation you know, happens not only because of original ideas, but also execution. So, like, you have the data, everybody has it. Who's going to do a better job with right. it? Right. So, I think it's that's it's, it's, that's a mindset that's hard to grasp for corporations. But yes. They will have hard. to get Very there. Hard. They Very will hard. have to get there. A, a couple of questions come in about the public sector because we're talking about companies, but you know, there's the government and there's education. The, the impact of millennials on the way we're governed uh, is it all going to be so good in 10, 20 years' time? Because these people are going to be everywhere, running. Every 
everything. Um, what's the implication for the public sector and what's the implication for education? I, I don't see millennials thronging to state government jobs. <laughs> no, no, it hasn't, so hasn't how can happened we get yet. Them in? But how can I think we get the them idea in? is that perhaps it changes what the structure of these governments are. Yes. To say it should be a little more lowercase democratic. Yeah. And, and to be able to share information that way, maybe more community activism will dictate the where governments go. Yeah, because you can share that information faster. I think the bureaucracy in those kinds of institutions is a huge turnoff. Yeah. Let me have it. My brother-in-law is a millennial, and he's in the county, but to get a pen <laughs> is like an act of God, right? And so he wants to do improve the efficiencies. But Sorry, the, what's a pen? <laughs> <laughs> he uses millennial a pipe when it's Millennial A thumb, thumb drive. <laughs> <laughs> but the, the layers is just a turnoff for anyone, especially for this But I, 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 would, I would argue that if you look at very smart governments where they start to do, they're actually talking about data. They're actually opening up that data. They're actually using, Great say, point. okay, you know, we have data. We do, well, they realize that they basically acknowledge that they're not smart at actually yes. surfacing and making anything out of the data. And they say, you know what, here's open data. It's free. Do something up with it. And they don't even tell you what to do with it. The, the most, of course, the easiest example is like, you know, the public transport data. And then you have like 20,000, you know, apps about where the next bus is. But I mean, there's, it can be about a lot of things. Of course, it has right. to be secure. We're talking about healthcare and some of the more. It, but, but there's a lot of things. These, in, this could change a little bit the image of government from that generation say, oh, you know, I, I can do cool stuff with that, right? And so Our research shows that education is actually a huge adopter of this stuff. And I think, you know, intuitively that makes sense. Their clients are the millennials, so mm. they don't really have a choice. I mean, when we look at, you know, are you open to social, are you open to mobile, Education as a vertical is way, way up there with a yes. Yeah, I think so. I, would, like I think you need to separate education and government very yeah. different. So yeah. I think you know, what we're saying is the disruption is going to come from below, but so long as above releases data. Uh, well, maybe not that, but uh, we're already seeing it. If you see the tension is already happening yes. between regulations and our regulation, when you see all these apps yeah. like Uber, you know, the, yeah, right. the, the, the ride-sharing app, I mean, the, you see a lot of states are being like, our cities are actually resisting, Airbnb, the fact that, I mean, so that you can, that tension is there. Yes. And it will stay there for, at, at least for a little while. I don't believe that's just opening up data. I'm just saying that that was be a, a, a way from people to be attracted towards like public, the public right. sector. To have, like, but right. it doesn't, will not, yeah. yeah. A bit more open, yeah. yeah. Can we come back to this issue of, of millennials in the workplace, how we motivate them, how, we get, how do we keep them? Anyway, in, in a IT structures that tend to be, by their nature, fairly hierarchical, there are certain things that need to be done, and you know that's not the kind of environment. You know, if, if they're only, the average stay is two years, how do we get them to stay ten? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think we were we were speaking earlier. Part of it is you got to blend the IT responsibility with the line of business of the organization. So they're saying, I'm not just this person in the back room that the guy always comes to when the laptop fails. Mm -hmm. It's I'm also contributing to the growth of the business. Business because partner, if, yeah. If mm -hmm. it's a viable business, it's one that's going to have some interesting developments and right. you get to, to participate right. in Right. I think engaging them, that's that's a huge key. You talked about mentoring. That's We've seen a lot of success with that. But just having them engage and knowing that there is a future vision from today where they can be and, and setting those milestones and their frequent feedback. I mean, those are, I mean, all the research always points to that. And then you got to build a practice. HR has to change. Yeah. That's HR the challenge is that the organizations aren't changing. Mm -hmm. All the research is there and, and we've seen evidence of it. But, mm -hmm. And in tech organizations, yes. yeah, but non tech, not so much. There should be a focus on HR. HR has to be like a customer center. Your employees have become your customers, your users, your customers. Mm -hmm. And the HR, the, the role of HR is to be risen. Talent is not about the acquisition of talent, but how do you nurture talent, how do you maintain talent? And not just being like some office when you just pay the right. pay slip. I'm, I'm being too but harsh, not, but, I mean, I think you know, yes. Uh, but Peter's right. You know, it's not just an HR thing because you say give it to HR. Yeah, exactly. That's like, why. Well, hang on a moment. It's, it's actually it's, it's the organizational, organizational. But the, right. I think the role of HR is to actually cater, be the, the catalyst, the cat catalyst, and see. actually see, okay, these people, why are they failing? Why they, why they, what do they want to leave? Right. What is happening? And have right. someone tracking, measure that, not to track to measure every single employee. Like, what is his, his own KPIs? Yeah. Tracking, are they happy? You don't match up resumes with job requirements. Exactly. You gotta really what know are the results that you're going to get? Yeah, I mean, I think you know this really goes back to there's a fair amount of macroeconomics going on here, right? So um, it's I was told there'd be no math. <laughs> <laughs> that test comes later. It seems justifiable that somebody coming out of school today or in their you know late twenties, their experience is, well the company doesn't owe me doesn't think it owes me anything, so I don't owe it anything. Yes. Mm -hmm. Agreed. So I am out for myself. Because, because they saw their parents they go saw, through that. They know, see the great recession, laid off, right? The great recession that, that yeah. really the rose con tinted well, glasses came off, right? Well I have my job next week, I don't know. Right. So I do think it's incumbent upon employers if they want to keep employees long term to enter into that contract. 
and sort of say, well, you know, okay, we don't want to go back to the 1950s and 60s, but maybe where we're at today is a little too far in the other direction. Which right? will be tough for some industries and easier for some others. If you're in a, in, a, in a consumer environment, that may be easy to do. If you were the government or the post office or yep. some other large, more staid yep. environment, it'd be a little tough to say, isn't this exciting? We're going to make more fasteners today. And, and besides, it's the quality of the workplace. We mentioned, I mean, of course, everybody talks about, you know, the Googles and the Facebook and how great the workplace is. But I don't think it's only the workplace, by the way. It's like the inspiration that, you know, they want a sense of purpose. Why do I get into a business? Because I'm going to change something and we're going to do, a, you know, this, this changing the world that is being kept and everybody talks about. Sometimes it'd be idealistic, but actually, these, you know, it's something you want to be in a business that means something for you. Right. And then also the quality of the workplace, it's not only about, you know, it's great to have like free food in the cafeteria, but it's not only that, it's having this collaborative approach. Of, okay, you have these small spaces where people can just sit down and talk within each other. It's nothing. And is it beyond the profit motivation too? I mean, I would, this sort of mission statement of companies. I think it goes together. Yeah, they go together because, I mean, why do you want to to keep employees past two years? Well, because as they learn, yeah. they have more to offer you as an organization. Right. So ultimately, your profits yeah. should go up. Right. Right. If you nurture those employees, and, and you're, you're not paying to replace them exactly. every two years. I mean, and the other aspect know. of it is, I think a lot of these employees, maybe we haven't really talked about that, is they're getting some level of satisfaction from what they do on the job, but there's probably something else they do that isn't on their sure. job. Yeah. Like I, I have a daughter who is a teacher, but she's an artist as well, and she's done both full time. She doesn't see any reason why she should stop doing one to do the other. So she may say, I get, I get what I need. I get my Maslow's hierarchy of needs. First couple on, this, on the job, and the rest comes from what well, I do. We'll just break it up. I mean, we'll have simple things like Nerf gun wars in the middle of the office, and that, you know, that's just engaging them. In a Air systems, air. Nerf gun bring your murders. Nerf, bring your Nerf, <laughs> Nerf guns. Uh, no, I read yes. it here first. <laughs> I, got the, I got the biggest gun. <laughs> you got the biggest gun. That's a, that's a CIA. Is story. that a metaphor? They <laughs> always <laughs> have the biggest gun. <laughs> and I, actually, something I also heard, we a number of companies that I, that I report uh, when I do my reporting. They, they say, several people have said to me, you know, it's amazing. You, you, what you see these days, you get parents calling up yeah. about their, their kids. Helicopter parents. Con contracts and stuff. Like, and you say, so I said, what do you do? Obviously, you, you blow them off. And they're like, no, 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 that's the wrong thing to do. You want to keep the millennial happy, so they like having their parents. Yeah, there's certain ones who've been conditioned like this. Have any of you experienced, I have to say I, I have not, not experienced this, but I, I have interviewed companies who have. I sort of can't wait, though. I hope somebody calls <laughs> I don't think I'd be as open-minded as your interviewee. Uh, I'd be afraid if they're calling when you fire them, that, <laughs> there's a problem. <laughs> I have not, personally. Okay. Yeah. When they bring a note from their parent while they're not there, then I guess I'll have to <laughs> sick. Bobby can't come to work today. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you know, it, it does raise an interesting, interesting question, right, which is that, okay, well, who is this person coming in, right. and are they, right. do they require more parenting? Well, mentoring. Uh, mentoring. Yeah. yeah. You know, they just often don't really know what they want to do. It, and at the same time, they just want to get a job done. They don't right. care about the contract. They yes. want to, oh, I want to start and do something yeah. right now. The contract, something what, interesting. whatever. Well, Paul, you said something before uh, we started about what they think the average number of jobs Thirty uh, by the age of sixteen to nowadays thirty six. So they will have thirty six jobs a in their lives. Sixteen year old, and they retire. Yeah, sixteen year old. Yeah. From but, I mean, again, you know, we mentioned depression. We, you know, it's just yeah. the, the actual the actual world we live in. It's Products, nothing. I mean, yeah. you know, and so and like you said exactly. Why do I owe something to the company if the company can fire me like this? I right. Mean, there's like mm -hmm. it's no, it's just a normality. So this is we used they to may be feel the personal loyalty to somebody they're letting down, yes. but not a corporate not a loyalty. Corporate no. But at the same time, it also creates opportunity for for for. for when you have more jobs, and I think you mentioned that your, your daughter had like a... 20, 20, 20 jobs exactly. at the age of 26. It also opens up a lot of... Uh, lateral, lateral thinking is something that's becoming more and more valuable. Right. When you start having access to all the knowledge you want on Google by doing a Google search, I'm exaggerating here a bit, but it's how, what, how do you connect the dots between everything, you know? A Steve Jobs was, did like, it was not only an engineer, it, 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 all these other stuff, liberal arts. So I think that it can also be leveraged. Having multiple jobs and very multiple fields around the world maybe, it, or a, it can actually have yeah. a huge impact down the Absolutely. line with someone having a, a very more open mind about how to collaborate, what kind of ideas to put together. You know, it's, I, I said before, everything is a remix. It's like, oh, I have this and I have this, why never? And they won't put them together. And some of these multiple jobs are doing at the same time. It's not a matter of laziness or no, lack of no, interest. No, it's a matter of sometimes uh, a real enthusiasm for doing things. I, I'm gonna, I had a daughter who was 
teaching English as a second language, lived in Spain, teaching English as a second language, and doing a blog for a tourist company, and doing other stuff on the side. Well, so that, that three is, jobs at once, because she liked it. That's the appeal of startups, as they're going to be doing yeah. many hats. Yeah. That's a great point. I think that's the biggest challenge for companies that are a certain size and maturity, is how do you, as we came back, you know, the, do you have the teams off on the side, the pirate teams, the Steve Jobs? Or how do you manage that? And that's, it's, it's a big challenge. Um, I just wanted to say uh, we have some time for more questions. You've asked some excellent ones, so please... Please, could you send some more questions in if you have them? Uh, hashtag CIO challenge or on the website that you're using. Every time and you say hashtag, I just I think of Justin Timberlake. Did, <laughs> so I think of you living I'm, in Colorado. I'm, 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 working, I'm, <laughs> I'm working. I wanted to be Justin Bieber, but nevertheless. Um, uh, the, the, the great question here is panel. So we talked a lot about all these different aspects of managing millennials. What should be a taxonomy? And it's like a, a sort of, you know, your, your bulletin board for tracking how you're doing with your millennial workforce. If you had to sort of produce the sort of KPIs that you're going to monitor, what, what's the taxonomy that you'd have? Hmm. Hmm. Interesting talk. But it's certainly, I would certainly want to see if the population is growing and what Trend, the average tenure, tenure yeah. of the tenure of the folks that are so, staying. So, so population growing, tenure, average tenure. And additional responsibilities they've taken on. What roles are they filling? Yeah. I mean, yeah. as they starting to get older into those management roles? And when they are, are in the management roles, how are they being compared versus the other manager roles that are maybe held by elders? And how fast they get there older well. generation. Right. Yeah. And how self sufficient they are. Great. Velocity, so velocity, yeah. size, scale. Uh, positions, anything to uh, add? I would actually look at, well, what kinds of uh, technologies are they using and try to find those connections that they're making within the, within the workplace. Right. Um, because I think they're the most likely to do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Did yeah. we talk earlier about the idea of marketing organizations now are almost, if not totally split, having a separate group that is managing just yeah. a certain type of media and other doing a... Mm -hmm. That's the same kind of thing we're talking about is, are they making connections? Are we making progress? My daughter worked in the, uh, PR, and she was the one for her company that started a blog marketing concept for one of her customers. Hadn't been done, this is only, this is only five or six years ago. Mm -hmm. There's a big shift right now. There's a couple articles where the CMO will outspend the CIO yeah. right. in the next five yes. or so years, and that, that's, and it is a large technology play. It is yep. a lot of technology in that function. And because I'm the economist journalist, I would say there has to be profit on there somewhere. There's got to be a number that's got something to do with the bottom line of the company. Oh, there so are a lot. Actually, that. I believe yeah. there are a lot. So you ma you mentioned an idea, so you mentioned the App Store for Enterprise. I mean, there's a huge play of who's going to actually create the software that does that and sell it. App Store for every yeah, enterprise. There's a few out there I mean, yeah, I know, but are, I mean, there yeah, are yeah. there are a lot of yeah. still opportunities around there that are catered to that that can be uh, that's exploited. That's provide our yeah. apps as, as a service. But if you think about it, of course, that's a, a, an enormous shift for IT and for I would say any C level executive to think about because you know look at um, uh, you know any of the apps and how they're developed today and it's it's so easy to consume them and then just say okay I don't need this anymore um, you know uh, I'm, I'm completely spacing on the app that just the, the inventor just said forget it I'm done I'm shutting it down um, um, Flappy Birds, Flappy Birds right? he's bringing yeah. it back I heard so, yeah. yeah there was an early <laughs> no, really? inventor beat that's a profit yeah. Yeah. Like he can't pay for it. his uh, whatever but <laughs> you know but think about that I mean so uh, on the consumer side that's who cares so right. now I can't play Flappy Birds but on the enterprise side of course you can't go that far because if everybody is suddenly using your app, you can't two Stranded. days later say, yes. well, we're not, you know, we're just yes. continuing it now. So we still need some controls in there, right? And we can't get carried away too far. So the model is good, but it will have to be adapted, obviously, and faster. for the end of the rise. There's a question about um, whether the workplace, sorry, millennials are adapted for the workplace when they turn up. Um, several reports say that the millennials are not ready to work. Is that true? And if so, what skills should they have the, been taught? The, that's the older question because everybody talks, what about the millennials in the workplace in a way is asked, do they actually want to come into the workplace? Right. Do they actually, the want, actually, do they actually want them? to come with you, mm -hmm. with you as a company? Right. Do they want to work in a workplace yeah. I've yeah. set up? I mean, again, I we, yeah. we talk about, I, 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 it's not the best example, but when you think that a company like WhatsApp was just bought for $19 billion and they were like 32 now, maybe 50 people, People that basically disrupted the entire SMS industry, okay. texting industry in the world. You're like, I choose this and a traditional corporation, I could do it myself. And you know, it used to be that to create a startup, you used to have like millions to have all the infrastructure. Now you can start a startup with your credit card. Mm -hmm. And you use everything is scalable, so you can start with a very little money and you can actually disrupt an entire industry with that. So the attractivity of that workplace, when you actually create your own ID, you might fail many times, but you, is actually very high compared to a traditional workplace. I'm not saying that everybody wants to go and create a startup. I'm just saying that 
obviously it has the workplace as to be ready because otherwise the people will just, or you will not attract the right talent. You will attract talent, but maybe not the right one because that right one will have left somewhere mm. else to their own, their own things. Right. Yeah, think about the jobs that are going to be either gone or totally revamped in real estate. Why do I really need a real estate agent now? Can I see, mm -hmm. I can go to Zillow, I can look at all the properties I want to look at, I can do with almost the exact, all the transactions, totally that. extra somebody yeah. to rubber stamp the... Uh, if we, if we think about 30 years down the line, it's even, it's, the shift is bigger sure. for... for right. for, we, everybody talks about social media, how great the social media allow people to talk, but if, if it's just ignition of the trend, yes. you know, you have access to information, then you can talk and share information, then you can start creating, and then you have open source hardware, so you basically can start printing, 3D printing. I mean, it becomes that it's just a place of a business as a business, as an organization, as a corporation, right. is being displaced by this kind of peer-to-peer -peer economy. Mm -hmm. So it's not only about how can we cater to millennials and the generation that comes after, is how can we survive as a business where actually the, 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 the falling cost of, of, uh, of production with innovation is actually allowing anyone, we have a computer in our pocket, yes. we can print anything we want. Right. That'll <laughs> be a big trend for the economists to be following is there's going to be so many more small businesses than bigger businesses, and a bigger business yeah. is going to be threatened by that. I think that's yeah. absolutely right. No, it's, it's, a, it's a very good point. I, I want to ask something um, uh, around sort of interacting with millennials. Um, how many of you have had the millennials in your workforce try to friend you on Facebook? And have you yeah. said yes? Yeah, I did. You did? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great. It was pretty cool. I, Only one. <laughs> yeah, just be one. careful what you yeah. post on yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. Well, you, have, you have a work, you know, yeah, Facebook exactly. and you have a personal exactly. Facebook. Yeah, exactly. Oh, so right. that's how you do it. There's a, there's a Kevin Suhu yeah, there here, could be, there's yeah. a Kevin Suhu there. You're going to be one that's yeah. your only, sir, yeah, you only have your friends and uh, your family. And there's big Nerf gun Kevin Suhu. There's big Nerf gun Kevin Suhu. Well, see, I really think this sort of gets us to the point where we need to say we need a Facebook for the workplace. Right. So, I mean, you guys are working on this. Right? Yeah. This is the yeah. idea, though, is that... Not LinkedIn. Not LinkedIn. Okay. No, no. A Facebook <laughs> for the workplace. So that, in other, I mean, think about all the things that you do on Facebook or Twitter. You follow people on Twitter who are strangers. On Facebook, um, you know, I would say half my friends are not friends at all. They're just people I met somewhere. And then it turns out I really like what they have to say on Facebook, but I don't really know them. You need to create those relationships, those networks within the corporate environment. And that, in my mind, is one of the biggest lacking that we have today in the corporate environment. Because it's the relationship are, between people well, within the so company. Well, we're so dispersed. But you mean within the company? Yeah, within the company, because we're like the so jives dispersed. And the you know, yes, yeah. all of yeah. your team, yeah. your 10 team members who are all over the yeah. place, if you could stay in touch on a corporate Facebook, then when you do come together, you know a lot more about them, right. you're mm. friendlier, you're more willing right. to work. I think that is what's really missing today. And, and in any complex organization, there are people who are the person that gets asked a question because they don't know who else to ask. Yeah. And if you can have that corporate Facebook type entity, then it's like, I don't have to ask that person. I just say, who knows about mm -hmm. this term? And that's one of the things that you said earlier, Mel, you were working on with with Ansible is I, I just put the term in, here's all the people who know about it. Mm. I use gamification to say, okay, who are the best at it? Now I get the answer, I don't have to wait for this person to get back to me. Uh, that's that's the, the way to do it. I agree, but I would just say anyway, if you look, how many emails do you get per day? I mean, communication is already <laughs> broken. I mean, it's not only about yeah. creating this uh, yeah. sense of collaboration. Email's gonna go the way of voicemail. Yeah, yeah. It, but it's also because at, at, at one point you cannot, it, there's a deluge of email every day that people just can't manage anymore. It's not only well, about millennials yeah, aren't using I, email I think we're going away from hence, email. Hence, yeah. hence, yeah. hence, I mean, there's, there's a company, uh, I think based in France, that they just shut down email. And they mm -hmm. just, just have like a, a, a social, mm -hmm. an internal social, social network. Right. 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 There, it's not proven, it's not, like, will it actually work? We don't exactly, you know, as to the question, the more light question, uh, would you, should you friend or not uh, 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 your boss? <laughs> I, 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 it happens, but I, at the same time you see also that millennials become less engaged on Facebook at the same time. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. Facebook is becoming just an address book. So I'm, I'm exaggerating a bit, WhatsApp but I mean... But it's because they're going to other, other exactly. ideas. So as you go, as you go somewhere they else, might you, you might, right, yeah, might you just... Safer. Facebook is just like an address book. I have, I, I know, you know, they will never be on LinkedIn. I'm exaggerating a bit again, but I mean, it says... so. I agree with you in a certain sense. I don't in the other in the sense that if it's a, fa I think a Facebook for for corporation for internal communication, which basically with the Yammer model, is effective, uh, very efficient for collaboration and communication within the company. But at the same time, it doesn't really uh, completely uh, answer the exact need. It's of a, a conversation group yes. and a conversation so, history that you really want to get at. It's how and I, I don't think that enterprise software will never be able to go as fast as consumer software in that space. And then. Yeah. 
Mm -hmm. You will always end up in that kind of, of process of having an external tool. So I'm saying but, it's... Yeah, but think about how you get information today. And I'll just you know use this example. So we're all in New York City, and uh, I had no idea that apparently there was a big explosion uptown in Harlem. And uh, when I came into here today, you know, someone mentioned that to me. I said, really? The first thing I did was go on Facebook. Mm. But I said, well, if this is really important, if something really happened, right. it's going to affect me. Somebody will have put it on Facebook. I didn't go to the Times. I went to Facebook. Yeah, Twitter so, for me. Yeah. Consumption. Twitter, Twitter, whatever it is. So things. I think in the corporate environment, the same thing can play out. Yes. Agreed. Right. Yeah. Agreed. I, I would love to continue this conversation <laughs> because it's so fascinating. And unfortunately, we, we have to wrap up now. Um, I'd like to thank my panelists, uh, Peter Greco from Unify, Kevin Suhu from uh, Air Systems, Paul Papandimitriou, um, who's a, a futurist and a very no. fine one at that. You cannot, you cannot connect the dots. It's Steve Jobs. From no. Futurist. Sullivan, we'll see. Melanie from Frost and Sullivan. Um, <laughs> thank you so much. And there's so many trends here that I, I could go on in my summary for a long period of time. But I think the two most important things that uh, I, I'm taking away from this is that one needs to have a sort of holistic, integrated view of how these millennials are entering the workplace. And one needs to not think of them as some kind of rare beasts that are special in, the, in out of the wild. But they are actually human beings that we can all interact <laughs> with. And we should find ways using technology in which they can integrate the workplace better than ever and teach us lots of things in the meantime. Uh, thank you very much for attending. Thank you for your wonderful questions. And I look forward to having you on future webinars. Uh, thank you very much indeed.